I'm sure you've heard of muscle hypertrophy before, but do you know what muscle hyperplasia is? Actually, I take that back. I have a feeling you actually don't know what hypertrophy really is either. Hypertrophy is when you make your muscles bigger, right? Well, yeah, but I mean like what causes your muscles to get bigger? Working hard and having a good diet, right? <sighs> yes, I mean what is happening to your body that causes your muscles to grow? Working hard and having a good diet, right? <sighs> Muscle hypertrophy in the context of exercise is the process in which your muscle fibers, the actual individual muscle cells themselves, expand in diameter as a response to resistance training. Uh, this increase in size is due to an increase in myofibrils which is directly responsible for forming cross bridges that produce force. The amount of cross bridges that form in a muscle is directly responsible for how much force is produced. That's why we can conclude that strength has pretty much a direct correlation to muscle, meaning that more muscle always equals more strength. Anyways, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, how is insert elite powerlifter's name here able to lift so much more than insert elite bodybuilder's name here? Uh, good question. And that's actually going to lead us directly into the topic of muscle hyperplasia. So the simple explanation for why elite powerlifters, despite being typically much smaller than elite bodybuilders, can lift so much more weight is that they are much more neurally adapted to the movement. Uh, they have better leverages, which is genetic, or having more body fat, and simply have just much better form. All true, I'm sure, especially for a movement like the deadlift where you can clearly see guys half the size of an elite bodybuilder can lift uh, you know, twice the weight. I think that this is most obvious when seen in elite powerlifters who can deadlift like twice the amount that elite bodybuilders can while being half the size simply because their arms are super, super long and you know they've mastered the movement of the deadlift. So sure, leverages, specificity, genetics, all could be possible explanations for the differences between elite powerlifters and bodybuilders. But here is another possible explanation as to why bodybuilders, despite typically being much bigger than powerlifters, aren't as strong. Here it is. It's something called muscle hyperplasia. Now, muscle hyperplasia is a little different from hypertrophy. Like I stated earlier, hypertrophy is the physical expansion of individual muscle fibers which collectively add up to a larger cross-sectional area in the entire muscle as a whole. Hyperplasia, on the other hand, is actually new additional muscle fibers, literally brand new tissue being added to the muscle. Uh, here's how it works. The first way is that large muscle fibers can split into two or more smaller muscle fibers uh, and second, satellite cells can be activated. For those of you who aren't familiar with satellite cells, they are myogenic stem cells which are involved in skeletal muscle regeneration. Whenever you injure, stretch, or severely exercise a muscle fiber, satellite cells are then activated. Satellite cells proliferate or undergo mitosis and give rise to new myoblastic cells which are immature muscle cells and these new myoblastic cells can either fuse with an existing muscle fiber, causing that fiber to get bigger, which is hypertrophy, or these myoblastic cells can fuse with each other to form a new fiber, and that is muscle hyperplasia. Now, believe it or not, as much as we know scientifically about hypertrophy, what causes it, what's going on on the molecular level, etc., we actually have no idea what causes hyperplasia other than the fact that it in fact does happen. So a possible explanation for the over-exaggerated size of super huge elite bodybuilders compared to strength athletes, uh, for whatever reason through training, nutrition, supplements, is that they have more individual muscle fibers than the elite power lifter, which would explain why despite being bigger, they're not as strong. Because although they have more muscle fibers, each fiber has uh, many less myofibrils and therefore less ability to produce force. For example, if powerlifter A had 100,000 muscle fibers in his pecs and each fiber had 100 myofibrils, he'd be able to produce a value of 1 million in terms of force to bench press heavy weight. While bodybuilder B could have 150,000 muscle fibers and 50 myofibrils each muscle fiber, producing a value of 750 force. Uh, but because bodybuilder B has 50% more individual muscle fibers, the cross-sectional area of his pecs are 30 millimeters in diameter as opposed to the powerlifters, which is 
20 millimeters. Now keep in mind this is an example that just spawned out of my crazy mind so take it with a grain of salt. A lot of this is theoretical and not proven. Uh, this is just a way to try to visualize the effects of muscle hyperplasia versus hypertrophy. But anyway this could definitely be used as a thought experiment as to explain why powerlifters who have physically smaller muscles have the ability to produce more force than bodybuilders who might be twice their size. The reason that it's mostly theoretical is because it's almost impossible to study in humans. You would literally have to cut someone open and count all of the individual hundreds of thousands of muscle fibers, put them back together, then prescribe a specific exercise program that you would predict induces muscle hyperplasia instead of hypertrophy, have the subjects come back, open them up once again, and count every single individual muscle fiber once more. And you would have to do this uh, to a few hundred people to make sure that it's a legit study. Okay, so it's pretty much impossible to study. Gains is life, don't get me wrong, but I highly doubt anyone is willing to get cut open, stitched back together, work out, then get examined and opened up again, uh, all in the name of gains. Would you do it? No, I didn't think so, neither would I. The scars I would accumulate from getting cut open would just completely throw off the aesthetics. Not worth it! Now, like I stated earlier, hyperplasia 100% exists. We know this for a fact. Most of the evidence for it comes from animals, but we do know that it happens in humans as well. Uh, the whole question is how does it happen? And that's the big question because we don't know. However, there are some theories, and I don't know about you, but if there's a way to tap into mo gains that you didn't know about before, I'd want to know everything there is to know about it. Well, luckily for you, I have no life, and I live off of researching minutia with an exercise science, so I got all of the info that we know so far. Okay, so the most interesting study about muscle hyperplasia comes from Jose Antonio's lab, in which he conducted a study which would become known as the bird stretch study. In the study, he attaches weights to the wings of quail, forcing them into a stretch position. The birds were then killed. Sad. And the cross-sectional area was examined. The birds had an insane increase in muscle fiber cells, aka muscle hyperplasia. Uh, so one could conclude perhaps that heavy stretching could for some reason induce muscle hyperplasia. And based on a review by Jose Antonio himself, <laughs> He concludes that training for muscle hyperplasia could indeed very much be a real thing. Hmm. Now usually I'd be pretty skeptical, but this wasn't no scrub that conducted the study. Jose Antonio is a very trusted source within the evidence-based community, and well-respected evidence-based influencers like Eric Helms have even cited him multiple times. So this is a very, very interesting thing to think about. I go over this particular study a little bit more in my video, The Bird Stretch Study, so if you want a more in-depth look into a study or a series of studies that might completely change the way we look at muscle building, go ahead and go over to that video. So something that's actually pretty interesting is that there were a few studies done on humans where despite not being able to directly count increases in muscle fiber number, certain findings could conclude that muscle hyperplasia occurred. The following is a direct excerpt from a review on the topic written by Jose Antonio himself. One study showed that elite bodybuilders and powerlifters had arm circumferences 27% greater than normal sedentary controls, yet the size, or the cross-sectional area, of athletes' muscle fibers in the triceps were not different than the control group. Uh, one study did a cross-sectional study in which they found that swimmers had similar type 1 and type 2A fibers in the deltoid muscle when compared to controls despite the fact that the overall size of the deltoid muscle was greater. Another study found that bodybuilders possessed thigh circumference uh, measurements 19% greater than controls, yet the average size of their muscles were not different from the controls. Jose also points out though that there are many other studies that do in fact find a very strong correlation between individual muscle fiber size and overall cross-sectional area, which <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> So how does one train for muscle hyperplasia then? Ah, the million dollar question. Well, keep in mind, like I said earlier, most of this is theoretical and it's hard to measure in studies on humans. 
But if we refer back to the birth stress study, we can see that in animals, there is certainly an effect on muscle growth while heavy stretching. Will there be the same carryover in humans as there was in birds? Highly doubtful, but I'd be willing to bet that there is something there. Now it has been proven that the eccentric portion of an exercise is just as effective, if not more so, than the concentric and isometric contractions uh, when it comes to muscle building and increasing cross-sectional area. I don't think it's a coincidence that elite bodybuilders tend to keep their reps slower as opposed to powerlifters who train more ballistically. Now all of this being said, I can't hit this point home hard enough. Progressive overload is proven to be the number one determiner of any physiological change. Uh, when it comes to muscle building. So that needs to be in place first. I'm personally not convinced enough that weighted stretching is sufficient enough to cause greater hypertrophy than actual training. If weighted stretching actually was more effective than the weirdos who actually wear a weighted vest everywhere they went would actually be jacked and not just look completely retarded. So my conclusion based on all the evidence is that doing the type of training that could possibly lead to increased hyperplasia should be a supplement to your workouts and not a foundation to your overall programming. And it could be something that you could strategically add to your programming based on what phase of training that you're in. So for example, with myself, I'll hold a stretch position in something like a lat pull down for a few seconds on my last rep of a set. And on the last set of that exercise, I'll hold it for as long as I can. Uh, I've been doing things like this for exercises like the lat pull down, incline dumbbell bicep curls, RDLs, uh, exercises of, of those sorts. Now because I don't want it to take away from the training intensity of the primary exercises, I'll typically only do these toward the end of my workout and prioritize them a little bit more when approaching a planned deload where I can afford to train in certain ways that might do more muscle damage and won't impact my strength and ability to produce force in any major way. I also think something to keep in mind is that doing heavy stretch training and increasing the duration of a set or increasing the time under tension of that particular exercise can increase metabolic stress, which is one of the three major contributing factors to exercise-induced muscle growth alongside muscle damage and mechanical tension. Thank you so much for watching, my friends. If you found this video informative and helpful, please give it a thumbs up, and also please subscribe and hit the bell button next to it. Apparently it's not enough to just subscribe to a channel now, you have to hit like a bell too in order to see that I actually posted a video. So if you enjoy this type of content, um, yeah, just do those following things to make sure that you see more videos like this in the future. So please subscribe. That will help me out a ton. And uh, thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys next week in next week's video, okay? Cool, have a good one. Bye.